Namaste. So today we're going to continue with the Vichara Sangraham. And this is the beginning of a series of verses that are very interesting because what Ramana is doing in this verse and in the next few is giving a short course in Ashtanga Yoga. Now, Ashtanga Yoga is one of those funny things that in the West is actually a misnomer because they only teach asana and a little bit of pranayama, maybe. But actually there are eight limbs, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. But they don't teach them. So I don't know why, where they get off calling it ashtanga. It's more like ekanga. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Ramana teaches the whole thing. And so do we. So let's take a look at today's verse. Verse 25. Devotee, how is breath control the means for mind control. Maharshi, there is no doubt that breath control is the means for mind control because the mind, like breath, is a part of air because the nature of mobility is common to both because the place of origin is the same for both and because when one of them is controlled, the other gets controlled. Text 26. Devotee, since breath control leads only to quiescence of the mind, manoloya, and not to its destruction, manonasa, how can it be said that breath control is the means for inquiry which aims at the destruction of mind? Maharshi, the scriptures teach the means for gaining self-realization in two modes, as the yoga with eight limbs, ashtanga yoga, and as knowledge with eight limbs, ashtanga jnana, by regulation of breath, pranayama, or by absolute retention thereof, kevala kumbhaka, which is one of the limbs of yoga, the mind gets controlled. Without leaving the mind at that, if one practices the further discipline, such as withdrawal of the mind from external objects, pratyahara, then at the end, self-realization which is the fruit of enquiry, will surely be gained. This is very interesting. First of all, the nature of the mind is similar to the nature of air. Prana. He means, when he says here the bodily airs or the breath, he means prana, life energy. Sometimes Prana is translated as bodily airs. There are five types of prana, and they go through the nadis, or subtle energy channels, of which there are 24,000, I think, or 48,000, or some large number like that. The seven chakras are the principal nadis. And that's good enough for us to know for our purposes here. But something very interesting is that both the mind and breath are composed of air. And remember, now air here means prana. So I could make a silly joke about airheads, but I'm not going to. Well, maybe I just did. Anyway, breath control leads to mind control. 
Mind control leads to breath control. They are interdependent. And we mentioned last time about anapanasati or mindfulness of breath in the Buddha's teaching. So the Buddha is also very much aware of this. In fact, anapanasati was the method by which the Buddha attained his enlightenment. Sitting under the bow tree, huh? watching the morning star slowly dissolve into the dawn, he realized. So this is possible because the mind and the breath are one. When the breath is suspended, mind is also suspended. People wonder, how can I meditate or how can I do Atma Vichara? when the mind is always jumping here and there like a monkey? And the answer is, you have to do Kumbhaka or Pranayama or Anapanasati to control the breath. When the breath is controlled, the mind is also controlled. So this is the ancient secret of the yogis. Huh? It's not that some guru is going to zap you, you know, pow, and suddenly you're going to get enlightenment. I know, I know, there are stories to that effect circulating around, but it may be possible for a very small percentage of seekers whose covering, whose dust is very thin and who simply need a slight touch to attain. But for most of us, we have to do the work of going through and controlling the mind, bringing the thoughts under control and the breath under control. And then that leads to a very interesting state where the senses are withdrawn from the world, or rather the attention is withdrawn from the senses. <laughs> Now, some people ask, and I also had this doubt in the beginning, that if the mind or the attention or the consciousness is withdrawn from the senses, and this is a condition for enlightenment, then is enlightenment some kind of a void, like a, a dark space with nothing going on? And the answer I have to tell you is no. Within the space of pure consciousness, Brahman, there is infinite variety, infinite bliss, and unlimited existence. You can plunge into that ocean of Brahman and explore forever, and you will never find anything twice. It's never repeated. There are no patterns. There are no structures. Everything is made of pure awareness. Yet, it doesn't have a name and form. This is very hard to describe in words. It doesn't have name and form because it's made of pure self-awareness, awareness of awareness. This is Brahman. So when the senses are withdrawn, or when the attention rather is withdrawn from the sense organs and focused within, if one has transcended desire and is not, you know, straining at the, at the bit to let the senses go again, uh, but rather focused very clearly on the inner self, with self with a capital S, that shines in the absence of mind and ego. Then the door will open and you'll find yourself 
in nirvana or nibbana, that world beyond words and concepts, beyond names and forms, that world where there are no patterns, where nothing repeats, there's no boundaries, no separations. Everything is one seamless whole. And yet there's endless variety. Uh, variety of what, you might say? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's impossible to describe, but it's very nice. You know, you see statues of the Buddha meditating, and he's got this little smile on his face. <laughs> I know why he has that little smile. Because the mind is our eternal enemy in the sense that it covers the truth of who we really are, of what we really are. We are Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. We are Brahman. There's nothing else that we could be because there is nothing else. There is only Brahman in everything. And if there appears to be a different individual, well, that's my... Uh, <laughs> if there appears to be names and forms separate from Brahman. That's Maya. That's illusion. That is an upadi, a covering. That is a vasana, mental habit energy. That is material conditioning, material consciousness. That is the cause of our suffering. Try to understand. The reason we're suffering in this world is that we think we are an individual. We think we're separate. We think we're different from the whole, which is Brahman. So then we identify with this body and we identify with anything in relation to this body as mine. You know, my house, my family, my job, my this, my that. And these things are all temporary, imperfect, and not self. So we suffer. This is the truth. And when we overcome these identifications and projections, and these various uh, psychological identifications and so on. And we come to understand our real nature. Then suffering goes away. Because we have detached ourselves from the cause. And in that state, there is an ineffable bliss. It's very hard to describe, but I think it could be compared to a great accomplishment. You know, some people like, for example, try to learn a difficult uh, piece of music on an instrument, and it may take them years of practice to get up to the point where their skill is sufficient to conquer this uh, difficult piece. Uh, or let's say an athlete who is trying to break some record or uh, bring some new form to a sport that has never been tried before and they're successful and they win. That Joy, that happiness, is a pale reflection of the happiness that comes when one conquers the mind. Because the mind is the cause of our suffering. And when the mind is conquered, there is nothing left 
unconquered. It is the greatest victory, the greatest success, and the greatest enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.